Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tom Whitehead. I'm uh, still a journeyman lineman, for the, journeyman lineman for the power company, but also the president and co-founder of the Emily Whitehead Foundation, and most proudly, Emily's father. And Emily is the first child in the world to have her immune system trained to beat her cancer. So Emily was born May 2nd, 2005, was completely healthy and stayed that way until just after her fifth birthday. So we were going into Memorial Day weekend of 2010, and on Thursday she was healthy, and on Friday afternoon we were in the Hershey Children's Hospital diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and she was on a morphine pump. In the beginning they told us this is the garden variety kind of cancer. If you have to have a child with cancer, this is the most curable, 85 to 90% chance She'll be fine if you do 26 months of chemotherapy. So we got started, and we would hear this often, but this, they would tell us this almost never happens. So two weeks in, we've only done two outpatient chemotherapies, and then we developed infections in both legs, and were taken into a room by the chief of surgery at Hershey, and he said, cancer's not your problem today, you need to save her life, and I'm probably going to have to amputate her legs. So we went into that surgery hopeful. Um, they did save her legs, but she ended up in the intensive care unit for that first month. And I talk about how our perspective changed quickly because the first day we walked into that cancer ward, I was completely devastated and thinking, how did we end up here? Emily's our only child. And then we ended up in the intensive care unit. They saved her legs. And a few weeks later, we were celebrating getting back to the cancer floor. So when you think things uh, couldn't get any worse, they can. So we got back to the cancer floor, and in that first month, she did get in remission and stayed that way for 16 months. So we did um, outpatient treatment up until October of 2011, and then we went in for a standard blood check one day, and they come out and said, this almost never happens, but Emily's in full relapse, and now you should go to a bone marrow transplant would be the protocol, so we'll have to identify a non-related donor and our goal then was to get the bone marrow transplant the first week of February of 2012. <coughs> they had identified a, uh, a donor and about mid-January when we were prepping her for that, and by the way, when they told us about the bone marrow transplant, they said her survival right now is less than a 30% chance. So we remain hopeful, we stuck together as a family, we tried to get to that transplant the first week of February of 2012, and one day they came in and said, your donor is not available to give their cells until the last week of February. And then they put Emily on hold. In mid-February, she relapsed again. And they said, it's time to take her home and enjoy the days you have left with her. So one of the best things I did um, is paged the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and said, I'm not ready to take her home. And we, we, need, ho we need some hope in the trial or whatever you got. And they said, it's amazing that you called us today because yesterday the CAR T-cell trial opened and it's never been tried on a child anywhere in the world. So now we're at uh, second relapse, transferred down there on March 1st of 2012 and we got to meet Dr. Stephen Grupp and his team. And uh, he explained to us that they would remove Emily's T-cells from her white blood cells, take them to the lab, genetically modify them, and then when they put them back in, they felt the science showed that uh, her cells would recognize her cancer as something bad and her own immune system would then attack her cancer. So, but after they uh, took her cells out on March 6th, she had to remain in isolation in her hospital room for the next six weeks. And they told us she had no immune system at the time. So they said, if you even go to the cafeteria and bring back the common cold, it could take her life. So it was a big day for us on April 17th of 2012 when Dr. Grupp said her cells are trained and we're going to put them back in her and we're going to see what's, what's going to happen. So over the next three days, they uh, reinfused her cells on day one, 10%, day two, 30%. She did fine those two days and then after day three, put 60% of her cells back in. And what we, we would learn then is each one of those genetically modified CAR T cells can kill 1,000 tumor cells. Emily weighed around 68 pounds at the time, and three and a half pounds of her body weight was cancer. So, so much cancer was dying so fast that it overwhelmed her system, and we ended up going to the pediatric intensive care unit where they induced a coma, put her on an oscillating ventilator, and she would stay on that ventilator for 14 days. And the second day into that, they come in and said, almost every child we get uh, in here on a ventilator, we get off, but unfortunately, Emily's not gonna be one of them. 
I said, please keep trying to help her because I know my daughter's going to change the world. So the next morning, they come in uh, during rounds, and they said, it's medically hard to explain how she's still alive, but we stayed up all night, and we identified an arthritis drug that's never been used on a cancer patient that we think will stop the side effects that's going on in her system. They gave her that uh, drug, and within hours, they were saying, we've never seen anyone this sick get better any faster. So that saved her life. And she woke up on her seventh birthday after a 14-day coma. Eight days later, she was cancer-free. So we did 20... <laughs> Thank you. And I like to you know, point out 22 months of standard treatment that failed her twice, and then we gave her her modified CAR T-cell therapy, and 23 days, uh, she was cancer-free. So um, we went home on... June 1st of that year, and we had a quiet six months, and the doctor said, you can tell whoever you want about what happened, um, but we have to wait for peer reviews. So during that time, we did an interview with the New York Times, and that December, um, the article uh, came out, and I'm going to let Emily tell you a little bit about how our lives changed again. When I was applying to college, the first line of my personal essay was, I am genetically modified. <laughs> I've come to use those words to describe myself now and embrace it. When I was younger, I didn't really understand the weight and the gravity of what had happened to me. I just knew that I had been really sick for a long time. I was missing school, I couldn't go home, and then all of a sudden I was better. Um, I got to see my friends again, I got to see my dog again, which meant a lot to me at the time. Uh, but then things changed a little bit. I was put on the cover of the New York Times as a seven-year-old, as a pioneer of a new cancer treatment, and from then on, I've become a patient advocate so no other child has to go through what I went through. And at the time, because of the New York Times article, my story gained a decent amount of attention. As a result, we've had the opportunity to do things that I will never forget. I don't remember anything really from that time in the hospital. I'm currently 20 and was diagnosed uh, at five through seven. Um, so usually my dad will tell that part of the story and then I talk about what I'm up to now. Um, when I was in the ICU though, my dad would talk to me even though I was asleep. And one of the things he said was, you need to get up because you're going to be a hero and meet the president someday. My mom did not believe that and was like, you need to stop saying that. <laughs> um, but a little while later, uh, after we got home and I was better, my parents picked me up from school and they wouldn't tell me where we were going. I thought it was like to the zoo, something like that. Um, but it wasn't until we arrived in Washington DC that they told me we were going to meet President Obama. At the time I was very young, so when I met him, he asked me if there was anything he could do for me. And I said, well, I miss school to be here, so can you write me a school excuse? <laughs> <laughs> and he did. Um, it says, please excuse Emily from school. She was with me in sign. <laughs> um, and we turned in a copy of it, and my school did accept that. <laughs> uh, today, I am a junior at the University of Pennsylvania, majoring in English and minoring in creative writing and photography reading, writing, and taking photos. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Reading, writing, and taking photos have always been a huge part of my life. During my time in the hospital, my mom and I read so many books, which gave me that love of reading, and ever since, I never stopped. I have way too many books at home. Um, but when I was going to Penn, and I walked up to my dorm, um, on move-in day, we realized that we had actually driven past the building that was my dorm every appointment and every time that we went to the hospital. Um, and from the window in that apartment, you could also see the PICU where I was um, at Chatham. So while school occupies most of my time, I am still very passionate about patient advocacy, and doing talks with my dad has become time that we get to spend together, even though I'm at school most of the time. And I talk about it today because it's too important not to talk about, especially during a time in which advocating for funding, for research, for more life-saving treatments is most important. <laughs> Without the research and dedicated scientists and researchers who worked on creating CAR-T, I wouldn't be here today. 
Without CAR-T specifically, regular treatment rounds would have likely led to side effects that would have prohibited me from being as healthy as I am today. Less toxic cancer treatments and the research and the funding that go into them have saved thousands of other kids and their families, allowing them to also grow into adults who can thrive. Thriving after cancer means getting to do the things you love again, see your loved ones again, see your pets again, and celebrate more birthdays. Even though cancer is only one chapter in survivor stories, it can be hard to move on. That is why mental health support is so important to ensure that patients, especially children and young adults, thrive after treatment. Mental health support is one of the many things I work on at the foundation and something that I am especially passionate about. Just because we are survivors doesn't mean that we are done fighting. It means we need continued care, compassion, and community to thrive. I hope that in the future, no other child will have to be in the hospital as long as I was and that the word cancer doesn't carry as much weight. I hope that every survivor gets the support that they need to thrive and that childhood cancer won't define a life in the future. I carry those hopes with me every day and I'll keep working on them until they turn into a reality for myself and for every other kid who comes next. Yep. So when the media hit with the New York Times, um, it was worldwide within hours. And with that kind of media attention, we started getting calls right away from parents of children who were going on hospice from all over the world, and that has never stopped 13 years later. So we started the Emily Whitehead Foundation with the mission of every day to pay it forward and just try to help the next child or adult now, we get a lot of calls from adults, have the same outcome as we've had in finding an advanced therapy. Um, Emily gets credited uh, with being patient one in what turned out to be the fourth pillar of medicine. For cancer, you used to have surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and now you have training the immune system, and when that works, it's much less toxic. So I guess the message we would like to share with everyone that's out there who's still fighting is if, if standard treatment isn't working for you, you do as much research as possible, you trust your instincts, and you never give up hope. And, and if you need help in finding an advanced therapy when you're out there looking for that, our Emily Whitehead Foundation has a team of people that every day do everything we can to pay it forward. So hang in there and thank you. Thank you.